them in that Q&A space if you can. Okay, it is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's guest. Dana Arafat's stories and essays have appeared in Granta, The New York Times, The Atlantic, and many more publications. Her debut novel, You Exist Too Much, follows the life of a young Palestinian American girl as she becomes a woman and is caught between cultural, religious, and sexual identities as she tries to find love and a place to call home. Moderating tonight's conversation is Rachel Yoder, the literary programming director for Mission Creek Festival and one of the founding editors of Draft, the Journal of Process. Her forthcoming novel, Night Bitch, follows a woman thrust into stay-at-home domesticity after the birth of her son, and she becomes worried that she's turning into a dog. I can't wait for that book, and it is forthcoming uh, next summer, 2021. Um, so now it is my absolute pleasure to welcome Zaina and Rachel to TNP Live. Wow. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having us, Politics and Prose and, and Brittany, especially for having Zaina in this amazing novel, which I'm totally obsessed with. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much, Rachel. And thank you, yeah, to Politics and Prose for hosting us this evening. It's so lovely to be here, um, albeit virtually. Uh, and I, I guess, shall I just start by reading a little bit from the book? Yeah, I think that would be um, wonderful. And maybe like giving folks who heard about the book but haven't read it yet, just a little kind of rundown. I'm sure they've read about it um, if they haven't read it, but maybe a little rundown of what it's about. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, I mean, it's funny. It's so hard to describe. It's basically a, uh, I think of it as a novel about a queer Palestinian American woman who is tracing a pattern of romantic relationships, many of which are destructive um, and characterized by love addicted behavior. Um, she's tracing this pattern of relationships against the backdrop of her Arab Muslim culture um, all while also coming to terms with her relationship to her borderline mother. Uh, so There's a lot going on. There's a lot to love in the novel. <laughs> Thank you. There is a lot going on. Um, a lot of intersections. So, yeah. So, the, the part that I'll read is from relatively early on in the novel. And I don't really, it's, I don't think it needs any setup or anything. So should I just dive in? Go for it, I can't. <laughs> All right, I'm just gonna dive right in. All right, where do you live? The professor wrote me. We'd met the previous summer, almost a year earlier. She taught French literature at the Alliance Francaise in Midtown East, in between semesters at Columbia. On the first day of class, she had announced that past students had told her she didn't smile enough. So, she put her palms on the edge of the desk and leaned forward, smiling, as if to say, here you go. I'd loved her since the day she kept me after class and suggested I was too harsh on Emma Bovary for her childish fantasies and for cheating on Charles. Emma's pathetic, sure, she said, pressing a polished fingernail to the word méprisable on my paper. From the dinosaur band-aid on that same finger, I surmised a husband and kids. But this is melodramatic. She looked at me, paused, then offered an effortful smile. For the first time, I noticed the dimple that appeared above her lip when she smiled, like a second smaller smile. While we stood there, I began to fall into its span. As I gathered up my things and walked towards the classroom door, she asked, is it so bad? I stopped and turned towards her. Is what so bad? To have an affair, she asked. Her question seared. It felt both suggestive and forgiving. At the time, a photo of Elliot Spitzer and his scorned wife, Silda, adorned the front page of the New York Post. I felt myself blush. I don't know, I said, but it is in this country. She laughed. Her laugh was deep and started in the back of her throat, getting increasingly lighter as it worked its way forward. True, she said. My body surged with heat. When I got home that night, I googled her. I discovered that she wrote fiction. A short story with her byline came up a simple piece about a woman struggling to keep her marriage intact as the other couples in their circle divorced. 
I wondered if it was based on truth, and I searched for details that matched her reality as I knew it. During class the following week, I made a point to mention it. I read your story, I said, nervous to admit it and tingling with excitement, as though I'd accessed some part of her that was now laid bare between us. Oh, she said. She nodded once, then offered the smile. Thank you. She appeared not to care whether I liked it, confident that it was good without my approval. Still, I felt encouraged to say, it would be nice to meet up sometime, maybe after the class is over. She nodded in return. It would. We met in early September at the Nespresso store in Midtown East, three blocks from our classroom. I showed up in a pencil skirt and a silk sleeve sleeveless shirt. The conversation flowed. She talked about walking her daughter to school, her husband's startup, their vacation home in Saint Paul de Vence on the Côte d'Azur. I tried to match her level of privilege and exposure. I've been to Nice once, I said. I didn't mention that I'd gone with Kate, my ex-girlfriend, towards the end of our relationship. I was worried that as a straight French woman, the entire concept of queerness would make her uncomfortable. We ordered cappuccinos. I resisted asking for skim milk so as not to seem too weight conscious or too American. I felt slightly tipsy as we left, though we hadn't drank any alcohol. When the bill came, I hesitantly asked if she would send me some of her unpublished writing to read. She placed her credit card on the table as I reached for my wallet, waving my hand away. You want to read more from me? She asked, sounding almost suspicious. I panicked. Until then, I would felt emboldened, but her response was humbling. I thought I'd ask, I said, if that's okay. Sure, she said. She smiled again. It was starting to feel more natural any time she did so. I'm just surprised is all. We stepped outside the cafe, and as we walked off in different directions, I felt overwhelmed. I wanted her. I wanted her life. I wanted to live inside her life while still living inside my own. I wanted, above all, for her to like me. Two days later, when she still hadn't sent any of her work, I followed up. Three essays appeared in my inbox that night. She seemed to be a guarded person, so reading her unpublished writing was like getting to cut to the front of a long line. The problem was asymmetry, as always. Not only was she straight, but she had a husband to share her inner world with. I, had, I presumably had my Anna's world, my girlfriend at the time, yet somehow hers was never nearly as captivating. I read each of her essays several times. They're nice, I wrote in response, still afraid to shatter a veneer of detachment. A month later, we went to lunch, but I couldn't eat. I wore a dress that once belonged to my mother, her gold hoop earrings, her Michelle watch. Anything beautiful that's mine was once hers. Now that I'd read the professor's writing, now that her sapphire wedding ring was refracting light from every surface, I was too conscious of my motions to land the fork in my mouth, so I stopped trying. Sorry, I said, laughing dumbly. I can't eat and talk at the same time. I'll stop there. Thank you. Yay! <laughs> thank, you, thank you. And thus begins, thus begins um, this book that is just so many kind of different levels of fantasy, right? Of being in one relationship and sort of fantasizing another relationship. Um, and the professor is like who starts us off into this whole journey the narrator takes. Yes. Um, so you don't mind, okay, I just wanted to rewind really quickly and ground us a little bit. You're in New York, right? Yeah. Okay, I'm in Iowa, and this, we're not just like floating heads on the internet, we're places, and we actually have history and context. Um, so Zaina and I were uh, classmates in the nonfiction writing program at Iowa, which is where we first met. And um, part of the reason I'm, there are many reasons I'm obsessed with this book, but um, one of the big reasons is one of the first things you and Oh no. Uh, when you, you came to Iowa. You froze. Am I there? Yeah, you froze a little bit. Okay, but, sorry. No, it's okay. Am I back? Yeah, you're back. Okay, so um, one of the first things that we talked about, oddly enough, when uh, you came to Iowa, I was a year ahead of you, was love addiction, um, which I didn't even know anyone really knew about. And I had, I had actually been, <laughs> this is now like decades ago, but like been to rehab for love addiction and had a very conflicted relationship with the term and with the whole concept. And so then to read a book 
um, where there's a character who, you know, takes on that title and goes to rehab for it and is like grappling with it was me back. I mean, you just read that line um, about the professor, something she said being both suggestive and forgiving about the affair. And I'm like, oh, yes, it's like the perfect combination, like the serotonin let down in the brain and like let the fantasy begin, right? Yeah. Um, so I was wondering, yeah, if you could just like, how did this like love addiction thing come up? Like this whole like kind of subplot in um, the book and like, what did you kind of, I mean, obviously like you wanted to explore that whole kind of you know relationships as an addiction um but can you talk a little bit about like that whole foray into the kind of like clinical exploration of love and relationships yeah absolutely and when we met and that night and i mentioned love addiction and you were like we should talk. I like um, gave you the eyes i'm like i don't know if i can get into it right now is she gonna think i'm crazy but and, we need to talk. Right, and we became very, very good friends. <laughs> um, you were also the only person I think I'd ever known, or any, or the only friend I'd ever met, or person I'd met in outside of like a love addiction or a rehab center who had heard of love addiction. Yeah. So um, I was really excited about that too. So basically how did that become, you know, the sort of one of the focuses of the book was that um, so I was primarily interested in exploring a question around like unattainability, I suppose, and unrequited one-sided love um, and kind of creating a character who had a string of like, I guess, obsessions with women who were in some way just like off limits. Either they were like married or they were straight or they were, um, there was some like professional boundary of some sort. Um, and I wanted to, I found that interesting and I wanted to kind of create a pattern of her pursuing women who bore these, who all bore a sort of a certain resemblance to one another and to one sort of central figure in her life, um, which was her mother. Um, and really, I guess at the heart of the love addiction, you know, thread of this is that, is that sort of relationship, the relationship with the mother. And I think, I mean, honestly, I was trying to understand this character just as much as like, I guess she was trying to understand herself throughout the book, which, which was to, like, and so love addiction became one lens through which to understand, you know, these relationships yeah. because they kind of do, I mean, they certainly do qualify as like, love addiction, first of all, is a real thing. Um, and I am like, I've seen it and I've, um, you know, it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's basically defined, at least in my definition, what I've encountered by a like relentless, destructive, like insatiable pursuit for um, the object of like one's affection all kind of reality and evidence withstanding <laughs> some way. Um, or you know so so yeah these relationships I, they do fall into that category and I found I, as I was sort of learning more and more about love addiction I just was like fascinated by the way that um, the way that it stems from a lot of kind of childhood trauma and just like you know, more, it, it, I think it's, re, it seems reductive in some way because there's just so much more to it um, in the same way that like any addiction has so much more to it and usually comes from some wound or some trauma or something that happens in often, not, not always, but like, so yeah, that's sort of how love addiction became a part of the book was to try and understand this pattern of relationships and, you know, how, what could, how we could make sense of them. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think that's very well said, and I, I think especially in like the first half of the book, I was totally transported back to my 20s and like all of the sensations and the fantasizing and the idealization um, that ha that can happen when you kind of like become obsessed with people. Yeah. Um, and I think too, so I was, I've also been thinking a lot about the title, You Exist Too Much, which is an indictment that the mother in the book levels at the narrator 
And I just found it really interesting because um, it's, it seems like the opposite actually of what the problem is for someone, well, especially for this narrator, because it seems like part of the problem is she like doesn't exist at all except like in relationship to other people, how other people see her, if she is loved, right? And that's something that just really resonated with me and I think resonates with a lot of people whether or not they're love addicts or just mm -hmm. 22 years old, right? Like mm -hmm. that sometimes we don't feel like we show up unless we're able to like see ourselves through someone else's eyes. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, the, the, the title has just been something I've, I've thought a lot about and, and um, yeah, which is, it has this kind of like weird irony to it. But I wonder like, what were you kind of thinking? Obviously it's like a line from the mother, but um, what was your thinking? Well, it? Yeah, I like what you said about the fact that like, um, you validate yourself through, the, through love and through being seen through someone else's eyes in some way. And I think, that for me, the title, so I guess, yeah, as you said, it's an indictment that the mother like levies at the daughter. And when you tell someone like you exist too much, you know, you're basically telling them you should exist less. Yeah. And so I think that for this narrator, so much of her struggle is to feel like she deserves to exist mm -hmm. in the world because, you know, most, many people, you know, they don't question that. But when you have someone telling you you exist too much, you do question, you know, your right to exist and like, you know, you feel like you have to earn your existence. And so in her search to earn her existence, she finds, she does do, she does so through these, through these relations, through, you know, the, this sense that she's um, connecting with these people um, and being loved by them. But actually, I mean, in a way, they're all an F, like, she barely is present in these relationships because the people that she loved at don't really love back at her. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's almost like she's repeating the pattern of like, or just like taking that command seriously of like, please exist less. So by pouring herself, you know, into these obsessions um, and not asking for anything in return, almost um, yeah. setting herself up such that she can't get it. So. Yeah, and I mean, also like the culture she comes out of, right? This very um, like Palestinian, the Arab culture, where um, I forget who, what, what national leader was it who's like, there are no more homosexuals in our country. Oh yeah, Iran. Iran, right? Yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. where you like the narrator is coming out of this whole kind of culture that's like, oh no, you you can't exist in the way that you want to exist, right? Well, exactly, and that's the other thing. So, I, I, a huge part of, I mean, so so many things can explain these the string of relationships, and one of them is um, internalized homophobia, where she sets her sights on these women that she can't be with because you know, she has longings for women, but she doesn't feel, she's so ashamed of that, that she won't actually pursue like a healthy relationship with a woman. So she'll just obsess over these women that she'll never ever be in a relationship with, um, a, a real fulfilling one at least. And so that, um, that, you know, existing too much as a queer person, and it's, as you said, like there's a, you know, Ahmed Ahmedinejad was, the president of Iran who said like, he denied like the existence of homosexuals and homosexuals as he called them in Iran and um, you know it does feel like a form of erasure to be from the Middle East and to be queer and you know even I've been to the Middle East before with a with a part I mean okay this is separate from the book like I myself <laughs> am queer <laughs> I've been to the Middle East with a partner and it was I thought it was lovely because we could exist or we could go around and do things but my partner noted that like yeah but as long as we pretended like we were just friends yeah. and I hadn't really thought about it like that because I was just so relieved that we weren't getting like I don't know attacked basically but um but yeah I mean you have to hide so many things that you for a long time I think I think it's changing in the Middle East but I do know that you know queerness and Arabness and Muslimness can be hard to reconcile and so yeah I, I mean, again, like resonated with this idea of like coming out of a culture that 
has certain rules and guidelines for who you can be and how you can be. Um, I grew up in, a, as you know, I grew up in a Mennonite household and my dad grew up Amish. And one time I asked him, what happens if someone's, if an Amish man is gay? And he looked at me and he went, he gets married and has kids. Like, it was just like the weirdest question to him. He's like, it doesn't matter if you're gay. You just, exactly. You just, you just that. get married and have kids. Like, right. Um, wow. it's, it's just incidental. Right. And so again, I was like, again, another, yet another reason I'm obsessed. With I this. never thought about that as in terms of your Mennonite background and having those like restrictions that, yeah, that, I mean that fuel, you know, bad behavior patterns in love. If you are not someone who necessarily conforms to those expectations. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, myself, I mean, I, I have tried many a time to kind of, you know, write about love addiction, untangle it, and have just failed miserably. Um, and we were at the nonfiction program together, and I know your your book kind of started there, right? You started kind of working through it um, mm -hmm. at the program. And so something I'm really interested in, I mean, I think it's fair to say that this is like auto fiction, right? It like draws from your own life. Yeah. Um, but... I guess why why write it as auto fiction versus memoir? Like, what can you achieve um, through that form that you can't? And I mean, for me, I will never write a memoir. I think it's like the most terrifying. Oh yeah, I mean, um, for <laughs> yeah, like why? Um, but yeah, I just wonder how you kind of like grappled with kind of shifting from a straight up sort of nonfiction form and then you know, shifting more toward um, fiction and a novel? Well, it's funny because it was, you know, I, great question. I guess <laughs> I realized that I wanted to take, so a lot of, you know, there's a lot of truth to the book, but there's a lot of untruth sure. to the book. Sure. And I, and right. And, and I was really, ex I became very excited to just really fully imagine a lot of these relationships and take them to like such extremes that I remember feeling like, oh, how funny that you could, if it was just, if I just wrote a novel, I could do that. You know, I could like take even my own fantasies sometimes and make them real in writing. And so I wanted to yeah. take a lot of my, yeah, just take some of my fantasies and just push them, push them forward into, you know, actualize them, I suppose. Sure. And I think that, um, so I think it was just uh, really taking things that were some, some of it. So, okay. The parts that are fictional was to take things that are just the, I guess the auto fiction, the fiction component of the novel, like is just taking what almost happened or what could have happened or what, you know, what if this had happened and just like being able to really push that forward. Um, and I, I think I liked the fiction aspect. I went with autofiction because it allowed for so much more, I don't know, mystery for me as a writer, like where I could literally like find out what the character was going to do because like, I didn't know. I mean, she yeah. took on a life of her own and like, I really found that to be exciting. Um, and I couldn't, I wasn't, there was no end point that I knew of because it was fiction versus like nonfiction. So I sort of had to follow her on the journey rather than like me being in charge. It felt like I wasn't in con as in control as, as the narrator was. And mm -hmm. I wonder if it would have felt that way if I had written like a, you know, nonfiction. If I'd sure. No. Yeah. So that was, that was, but I definitely did have to like learn how to write a novel, <laughs> you know, cause like such a different form. Um, and I think that in many ways there's, there is a lot of like essayistic, qualities to the book uh, just formally speaking oh for but, sure yeah. yeah but yeah I just wanted to like take the almost and fully imagine them and to just follow this character and see what she did next without being constrained so what what was it like taking something that was like so personal and so fraught mm -hmm. um and turning it into art crafting it I mean how how long did it take um you know, what were the kind of ups and downs of the process? Um, what was, 
you know, you talk a little bit about like the pleasure of writing this, like the kind of like pushing the fantasy, making it more, you know, the most of what it could be. What were yeah. some of the sort of struggles of mm -hmm. um, your process too? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, that was like eight questions. So <laughs> if you could just go through all of them, that'd be great. <laughs> I mean, I, no, I will. I think that the, so, so much of the, it was funny because so much of the process was like, solving the puzzle really of like what is going on here really with these obsessions and the string of relationships because um i didn't really know in some in some way mm -hmm. i mean i knew that i wanted to essentially write a book about a i, I think as i was writing it I, I i understood um as i put together you know if as i put the novel together because it it i didn't write it like kind of linearly um I wrote like the addiction center, like the rehab connection sort of on its own. I wrote a lot of the like flashbacks on their own that take place in the Middle East. And I wrote a lot of the love stories just like individually and sort of piecing it all together and understanding what is behind the string of relationships um, and how does it relate to this other strand of this novel, which is like the mother daughter relationship. And so, so much of the process was putting things in different orders. Um, honestly, and like seeing how they spoke to one another and sometimes they would speak to one another in a way that revealed like the answer to me um, of what was happening. And I do remember the moment when I like understood what was going on with this character and her psyche and like, and I felt so, I was just like, oh wow, that's so interesting and so simple, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, it took me, I guess, I don't know, a number of years write the novel probably six uh and a lot of time literally just like taping the pages of the book to the wall and seeing what what order they should go in and then a lot of time um getting feedback from our peers <laughs> um, and crying a lot of crying you know obviously um, it's an essential part of the uh, writing process i've huge, found yeah hugely essential and and a lot of running actually and going to the like just running because that's when my mind is so loose and I can think about things in the book and like piece, figure out answers to like plot points or whatever. But yeah, yeah, I mean, that was like, that was a lot of the process was like structure. The structure was where the answer to the questions really were. Lies. And it was, and it was such a delight. I mean, I especially, I think the first half of the book is a little bit more flashbacky than the second half. Yeah. Um, but it was such um, a pleasure to read that. And, and it was this process of like discovery as a reader to see these moments that are in, you know, oftentimes different countries, different times yeah. set again with different characters set against each other. Um, and it really created this beautiful kind of kaleidoscopic portrait of um, the narrator, which was really affecting and which I really loved. Oh, thank you. Um, kaleidoscopic. <laughs> I see there are some questions here. I have a few more too, but I want to make sure we get to some of these. And I think, I know this is one you've answered before. Um, but, oh, first, someone just has a, you exist too much, also a translation of a common Arabic expression. Is that indeed the case? That's funny. Um, I'm not sure. But speaking of that, in terms of the title, I mean, like, that was the other kind of macro level of the title was being Palestinian and, you know, your existence essentially being denied because you don't have the right, right, to, you know, right. You don't have the right to statehood, you don't have the right to self-determination. Um, these are things that validate a people's existence and that is, I, I think that there, there's so many levels of, I think, just uh, what informs any person and in this case that is something that also informs this character, right? you yeah. know, on that like kind of collective cultural level. So, but I don't know if it's a trans, it, what, how it would translate actually in Arabic to say it exists too much. Um, but the, I should find that out. I speak Arabic, but that's a somewhat tr tricky expression. Yeah. Um, I'll ask my mom. Yeah, I think they were asking if there is some sort of phrase that already okay. that it comes from, but. Um, Maybe so. 
uh, wait, there was something else. Okay, I'll, I'm sure my brain will skip back to it. Sure. Um, so someone asks, Eliza, uh, why did Zena choose to not give the main character a name? A name? The narrator, um, why is she remain? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good- oh, Did I cut out? You did a little, but I knew what you were saying. You cut out just a little. Um, why did Zena choose to not give the main character a name? So yeah, that was an intentional decision. At first she did have a name and then I took it away. And um, the reason she doesn't have a name is because so much of the book, because of like this, you know, impulse to um, exist, impulse she has to exist less. She spends a lot of her time like negating herself, both through, mm -hmm. she has at some point in her life, she has an eating disorder, she has anorexia, which is really a form of like self erasure. Um, and she pours herself asymmetrically into these relationships such that she doesn't exist within them. And there are some relationships where she doesn't even have any like words or dialogue. It's just like all of the action takes place without her speaking. And so her not having a name was for me a way for her to just exist less um, on the page and to, yeah, it just spoke to that that struggle that she has that flight of hers or that impulse so yeah that's why that is why yeah i thought it was a really smart i thought it was really smart and effective um decision Thank you. uh another question from eliza which actually folds into something i wanted to um talk about She's, and Eliza says, I love this book so much. Oh, well, thank can you. Zena, can Zena speak more to the various settings that she chose to integrate into her book, particularly from the author's childhood in the Middle East, vignettes from Amman, Palestine, Egypt? Um, and also just something I was thinking about reading this is how, how, like what a citizen of the world the narrator is, how she just kind of like, seamlessly crosses borders, speaks in different languages, is like moving through all these different cultures. It really struck me when the um, Argentine uh, novelist was like, let's go to Brazil, right? Does he want to take you, take her to Brazil? Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and the narrator's like, sure, because it's like not a big deal. <laughs> to South America. Anyway, um, it struck me at how adept she is at like navigating the world uh, and, and yet a love relationship is still just so evasive, right? Like have, finding this kind of like um, forever really. Anyway, I'm just babbling now, but no, basically Eliza can you speak more about the various settings? Yeah, no, I like what you were saying too. And um, I think, so yeah, the various settings. Um, so, I, so, so much of her life, I suppose, has been spent kind of no, moving around a lot or just yeah. like a lot of, as Rachel said, like in betweens and crossing borders. And um, so I think, so in betweenness is like a major something I was interested in and something that this character is embodies. And these places that she visits are a part of her, it's weird, she's like of them, but not really. She's Palestinian and, uh, or Palestinian American. Her mother is an immigrant. And so her mother like belongs to the Middle East. And, you know, the character supposedly is belongs to both the middle east and the united states but actually she really belongs to neither because that's sort of how it feels when you have um when you're in between i mean it doesn't feel like you're fully a part of either and when you're in the state you feel more you feel too arab and when you're in the middle east you feel too american so i i guess and i want to you portray that so well too oh, okay. in the book. i really felt that you know like how wherever the narrator was, she was like, but I'm something else. Well, uh, yeah, and she like feels, she's very alienated in, in some way, and even like being a DJ is alienating, and she doesn't have a queer community that she belongs to, or uh, she's just alienated, but, yeah. but like the settings were meant to, I wanted to just place her in these places just to show, to try and exactly, like capture what that looks like to feel, and specifically to feel 
just alienated from your Middle Eastern like heritage by virtue of the fact that you're, you know, you, you're supposed to belong there. I mean, it's one thing to go to the Middle East to go to like Egypt as an American, or to go to Jordan as an American, or go to the West Bank as an or like as anything other than an actual Arab, which she is, and um, and and it's another to go there as an Arab American and to feel like, I don't know, this this awkward, alienated, um, sometimes humorously so, feeling. Um, like in the opening where she's embarrassed because she's wearing shorts and has to trade. And it's meant to be funny, you know, because it's, 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 some of these moments are humorous, but they can also be, they can also like lead to like lifelong shame. Uh, and so, so yeah, that's what those settings are about. And then the, the like crossing borders. Yeah. I think that that's also alienating in some ways, like this lack of so much of what she wants is to belong to something. And she's kind of like it's hard it's hard for her to find that sense of belonging i think because she is so like crossing so many borders and and it feels like neither she can't claim any one thing so she's trying to claim both but then belongs to neither (laughs) yeah yeah and i think that that's again really well put and i think it again it intersects with her relationships in that, and this just occurred to me that she's really quite homeless, right? Like she's searching for her home and, and finds that in other people as so many, so many of us do in love. I mean, what is love if not finding your home, right? With another person. And um, of course that's going to be, you know, this very strong whole um, to find home in another person. It's almost like essential. It's almost, you know, like, of yeah. course that's, that's what she's doing. And of course it's, it's, um, kind of like dire, um, yeah. like feeling homeless already. And I wonder if the, exactly. I wonder if like even the love addiction and how powerful her like love <laughs> feelings are for these people is also because of the lack of home in like, I mean, she literally sort of lacks home by virtue of like her cultural sort of in-betweenness. And she also doesn't have like a strong, she didn't grow up with like a stable home life or like a parent figure that was like really just, she didn't have that unconditional sense of home. And so like when you become an adult and you don't have that, you know, you're really like, yeah, she locates it in these obsessions. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, and when you find it, it feels so good, you know, like, fine, it's such a relief to, like, find that home with someone, so, of course, you would, again, I'm just, like, projecting all of my own stuff onto your book, Zaina, no, but, but I think um, that's, I, I, I was I, I, it. It's shedding light on, for me, it's helping me understand even more, honestly, about like, because really it was like a puzzle and a mystery to understand, like what's, to really get at like the psyche of this person and like what drives her. Um, and, and I mean, yeah, that, yeah. that home search is like a huge driving force, uh, even more so because of her relationship to it. I also don't want to pass up what you were saying about funny moments. I mean, I think this book is, uh, there are also some really funny lines. I'm recalling off the top of my head, a joke about some madrigals, um, (laughs) which I thought was really funny. I mean, (laughs) Um, and I think that's, you know, one of her, her ways of surviving and coping is um, through her humor. I mean, I also thought so much of the rehab stuff was hilarious it's um good it's meant to be funny in part (laughs) and painful and like you know some moments that are not funny but there's also some that are because you know it's just like a common it's like a trope that I feel needs to be taken that I've only ever seen it portrayed in really serious ways and I was like well there's also a lot of humor to that to that you know to to that experience yeah. and to just that whole phenomenon um and yet there's a lot of like I think you know I think for me so much of the treatment center like I mean her initial resistance to it I think is is quite funny 
and her observations about the place. And, and yet, I think it becomes a really important thing for her because it's one place where she finds like community of some sort, an unlikely, a really unlikely source of community for her. Um, and she connects with people that she never would have imagined herself to connect with. Um, and it's such an, speaking of setting, I mean, like, it's such an unfamiliar setting for her. Um, the, uh, being in wherever it is, like, Kentucky, and being in just, like, among people that she's never really been around, um, and it humbles her, and it's, and she needs that. So I think that's part of that, the importance of that setting for me. But yeah, yeah, it's, um, yeah. Okay, sorry, you froze up a little bit there. Can you oh. hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think it's probably me, but mm. I have t there are two more really great questions from um, oh, Anonymous cool. and jo Joanna. So let's, um, I wanna ask those. Um, so the first one is social media quantifies, commodifies, and monetizes the idea of liking of being seen and even the idea of love itself, we, you know, offer our little hearts. Oh, so How do you feel, yeah, right? How do you feel social media intersects with the topic of love addiction, both in real life and for your characters? That, I mean, yeah, talk about the internet and, yeah creating a persona and being perceived and wanting to be loved. Again, how do you feel social media intersects with the topic of love addiction, both in real life and for your characters? I mean, so it's funny because I guess I tried to leave social media out. I mean, there are moments of social media. Sure. Yeah. And that's the character feels really so validated when like one of her obsessions, you know, likes something of hers. Of course. Um, and yeah. like, uh, yeah, and that's right. And she also like sort of stalks. And, uh, but like, I, I think that that's the problem with social media, <laughs> to be honest with you. <laughs> like, is that it makes you feel loved and seen and, you know, um, not alone, like attended to. And uh, I mean, I don't want to take it away from anybody and say like, oh, you're not seen and you're not loved by social media it's but because sure I mean it has especially in these times in our COVID times like it's been such a huge source of connection and making people feel and myself included like a lot less alone at the same time there's such a danger to living by likes they're like living according to likes because like when those likes first of all they're not actually um offering the they're not fulfilling real actual needs i think when it comes it's just to a hit it's like an addictive yeah. hit right, exactly. like, what, what, what's, it, it, totally but yet like yeah I, I, but yet sometimes when you the problem is like the feeling when you don't get them right like that mm -hmm. is, that, that's so it feels painful in some way i mean i actually don't like social media i really am resistant to it i feel really ashamed anytime i post anything which um is hard when you have like a book because you have to post things, but, but I like, but I could also see the feeling of like exu like just the exhilaration when you get so many likes. I mean, Rachel just posted a, a really cool bit of news about selling the movie rights to her forthcoming novel. And I saw that she had like over 700 likes, maybe like now it's up to like 5,000, but like, I'm sure that felt amazing. I mean, like, I'm sure selling the movie felt even better, but I think that um, it can feel so, it's intoxicating. It can, social media can be intoxicating, and I think anything that's like intoxicating, you have to be careful with, really. That's yeah, I mean, it's highs and lows, right? Yeah. And yeah. it's giving power to something that's not entirely real. Um, I think we were also talking the other day in a group chat about the correlation between the amount of time you're on the internet and lo and how lonely you are, right? And how the more people are on the internet, the more they're on social media, there's actually a correlation with like the more lonely they feel yeah. um, because it is this sort of like addictive cycle of highs and lows. Um, yeah, and it, you know, it's contributing to this kind of culture 
culture of addiction that I think we all to a certain degree are participating in and, and struggling with and trying to figure out how to manage our poor human brains don't quite know yet how to um, keep up with all of this. Yeah. Um, there are a couple more questions that are really great though. So are you up for just a, two more quick I ones? love questions. Okay. Um, do you think about this character even after finishing the book? I do. I do because people have, uh, first of all, I do. I, I, I find that she can be really painful to watch and she can do things that are, you know, um, shameful and, and, or just like she can behave in destructive ways. Um, and that's hard to see. And, but I, but I found myself, I do love her. Um, and I hope that the reader does too, even though she sometimes really, she can be unlikable, but I still think she's lovable. Um, but I think about her because I know that the, like when I think about where the, where she ends up and I, I just, you know, I know that for her, cause we see like, I mean, that she's always just sort of like so close to like slipping back into bad behaviors and bad patterns that even when she ends up in a more stable place, you know, I, I mean, give away the ending, but I, I still I just worry about her because there are signs that like she's always going to be somewhat beholden. To, it's going to be hard for her to maintain, you know, um, the progress that she makes. But I think that's real and part of like the struggle of any addiction is that like, yes, you make progress and that's fantastic, but you're always just like one step away from like slipping back. And so of course I, I think about her because I worry about her and, um, and because I love her. So, because <laughs> I spent yeah, so much I mean, time with her. Right. And I think so often, you know, regardless of how similar our narrators are to ourselves, mm -hmm. they're someone we've like spent a lot of time with. They're someone who stays with us after we're done writing something and who, I, at least for me, and I'm guessing this is probably true for you too, like gives us more insight into ourselves ultimately, you know, like ourselves and the issues we're kind of grappling with and thinking about and I would assume that the narrator of this book would um you know kind of be a meditation to on like your own life um of course because like she's why? wonderful I love the I love the unlikable but definitely you know there's sometimes she's unlikable but she's always lovable which is so true I mean to see someone struggling yeah. it's just so human yeah right. Yeah. And, and yeah, of course, the ideas are ones that you're meditating on yourself, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, because like, why else would you write them? Unless, yeah, exactly. You know, right. Like channel them into characters. Okay. So I got a good one for you to close it out from Ashtar, mm -hmm. um, who says, thank you for this generous work, Zaina. Could you talk about writing the narrator's relationship with her mother and the way her mother held the relationship hostage to the lack of conformity and yet how she remains in her life so oppressively even in her absence i mean the mother character definitely looms large in this book and is really kind of like the source from which um a lot of the narrative and plot sort of um arises yeah i mean so Right. Creating the mother relationship was the hardest part of this book, I, I would say, um, because I wanted to show it from all sides um, and to show how the mother could be, could be, a, you know, rageful and like a terror in many ways and hurt this narrator, but to also show the ways in which the mother was like just a human being and who, who was more, who, who just also happened to be a mother and who had her own like sort of backstory and, mm -hmm. you know, her own pain and her own trauma by virtue of growing up in, you know, the West Bank under occupation and in between wars and coming to the U.S. as a very young person, uh, being married young, like all of these really painful parts of the mother's life and, and, and trying to at once convey her in her own right and to convey her in relation to the narrator. Um, and so that was very, very difficult. And I think that I wanted most of all to arrive at a place of love and empathy for the mother, but 
um, but also really, yeah, when you say that she remains so large in the narrator's life, even in her absence, that's right. Because like in the sort of second half of the book, she's so much less present. Um, I mean, she's still present. We still have her. There's still some, like, many of the most, I guess, significant scenes are with the mother in that second half. But it's the narrator really trying to, like, live her life without, like, being beholden to her mother's approval. And yet, and yet, she can you know, and yet right? Like the mother is still so present for her. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that it's the sort of central, maybe the central unrequited love in many ways of the book, um, as, as you pointed out. And um, that to me is so, uh, that to me makes, I don't know, that to me feels somewhat sad but also beautiful and um yeah I think it feels again I really resonated with that I think it feels very true and honest um and is beautifully rendered in the Rose. hello no. yearning for her mother like profound yearning for maternal love yeah. while at the same time needing to be, to live her own life, needing to become who she needs to become, like regardless of, you know, whether her mother's love will be given or rescinded. And that, again, like, who among us cannot to some degree um, relate with that, with, you know, the necessary pain of growing mm -hmm. up and moving on and breaking at least to some degree away from your most beloved, your your first beloved, which is your parents, um, especially your mother. Totally, totally. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a gorgeous novel, Zaina. I hope you feel so happy and proud. I know you've been working so hard promoting it and I hope everyone here buys a copy if you haven't already. Thank you. Um, it's absolutely wonderful. And I am so happy to celebrate here in this weird world we're all living in, in 2020. Um, with Rachel, you. thank you so much. This, I have loved having this conversation with you. And I know, I just want to call you now and we can like chat it up. To. And thank you to everyone who's here. I've, it's, it's really, I'm just so happy that you're all here and I appreciate it. And thank you so much to Brittany and to Politics and Prose as well. One of my absolute favorite. I mean, yeah, I, I grew up in DC, so I love politics and girls. Yay. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you guys so much for doing this. This is a perspective that is so absent in in fiction, I think. So this is such an important novel um, from such an, an interesting and unique perspective. And like Rachel said, everyone go buy it. I've dropped the link in the chat for you to pick it up. Um, Rachel, I'm gonna track you down and we're gonna have you for your novel next year. <laughs> yeah. um, I'll be there, I'll get my vaccine and I'll be there. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> but thank you all so much. Thank you guys for coming and everyone have a safe and happy weekend. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye everyone.